Hello there, very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. Do constant reminders of terrible things that have happened prevent them from happening again? If so, why tear down statues linked to slavery? Of course, the other side of the coin is that statues glorify dreadful aspects of history. Why not consign them, like slavery itself, to the past, to the rubbish dump? The arguments for and against on Round Table. Monuments of controversial figures have been a target during weeks of protest against racism and inequality. Since the death of George Floyd in the US last month, there's been a growing campaign to remove memorials to people with links to the slave trade or colonialism. In the UK, a statue of slave trader Edward Colston was torn down by protesters in Bristol. Another slave trader, Robert Milligan, was removed from public view by authorities in London. The city's mayor announced a review into all its statues. Activists have identified 60 monuments across the country they want removed. In the US, dozens of monuments to Confederate leaders who wanted to maintain slavery have been taken down in recent years. Scotland's first black professor, Sir Jeff Palmer, has argued that these statues shouldn't be removed but used for education. For others, they are unacceptable symbols of racism that cannot be allowed to stand. So should they be protected or put away for good? I'm very pleased to say that we can welcome to the programme Lawrence Westgaff, a historian specialising in black British history and slavery. He's in Liverpool. Natalie Zacek, senior lecturer in American studies at the University of Manchester, also joins us. And Lord Clive Soley, Labour Party politician who campaigned to get a statue built to honour Mary Seacole, a black nurse who tended the wounded in the 19th century Crimean War. Good to have all three of you on the programme. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Clive, can I ask you, first of all, I read a letter that you wrote jointly um, with Geoffrey Palmer to the London Times, in which you said tearing down these statues is a big mistake. What was your reasoning? Basically, I think uh, if you try and uh, bury your history, you can't learn from it. So I, I, I have no problem. Indeed, I would encourage a, a more explanatory um, a plaque or, or memory in a museum or whatever for these statues. I don't object to them being moved particularly, but I think just trying to bury them and get rid of them is and um, pushing them over is not a good idea. The key problem in Britain, frankly, has been for a long time institutional racism, and it's that which we've got to deal with. Um, and I'd far rather that focused on that than simply getting rid of statues, which uh, I think tends to be at best short-lived and won't necessarily teach people uh, about the past and how we need to Well, you to see, I was, I was looking at um, the campaign that you ran to get Mary Seacole's statue built, and uh, one of the lines you put on the website was um, about people who'd come to this country, the UK, from across the world to be part of our society, and I'm quoting now, and who've added so much of value, making it such an open, diverse, and inclusive one that we all appreciate and enjoy today. What we're seeing here is the exact opposite of that, isn't it? I think it is, and the dangers are real. I mean, if you read, Mary Seacole also was uh, one of the first black women to write an autobiography. If you read that autobiography, there are several statements in there which are very clearly racist, um, and including against people of African origin. Now, she and, and let us be clear: she was British Jamaican, wasn't she? Well, she was born and brought up in Jamaica, and she lived most of her life there. She got herself to Britain at, uh, on a couple of occasions, actually, and then got herself to the Crimea to nurse soldiers there. She nursed in South America and in and in the uh, Jamaica too. She ended up her life ended up in uh, Britain, and she was very very popular here, actually, particularly with. But racist as well, you say. Well, there were comments the in the there book were... which you, if they were said now, would cause distress to people who had strong views about this. So you have to understand it in the time. That doesn't justify it. It does mean to say we have to 
learn from the past but not bury it you that's what my worry about pushing statues over and just getting rid of them is uh, it's far better to learn from them that means either keeping them there maybe with a plaque up possibly if they're particularly uh, obnoxious in their history maybe putting them in a museum or something of that nature simply pushing them over think- even if if we did that with all yeah. statues you'd simply fairly soon run out of steam and George Floyd's death would have almost been in vain. And I, I, I regret that. I mean, it would be a great pity if we lose this opportunity in Britain, I'm talking about now, not the US, to deal with institutional racism. You see, the thing is, um, and Natalie, I, I know you looked into this, is in other countries, I think in Budapest as well, they have moved controversial statues to a place a museum or in some cases in another country to a cemetery where they can be viewed for what they are rather than in the sense glorifying what they represented at one stage. Yes, that's the Memento Park on the outskirts of Budapest and many of the statues, for example, to Lenin and to Stalin that were erected during the period of communist rule and were very unpopular after 1989 were removed from their sites in the city center and then taken to the Memento Park. Anyone, whether a tourist or a Hungarian, can go there. They can see the statues. So the statues were not destroyed. Uh, The history was not denied, but many people who had suffered under communist domination, particularly after 1956, really did not want to walk down the street to go to their job or the corner shop and walk past, for example, a statue of Stalin. You know, they found that that was, you know, psychically wounding to them when they themselves or their loved ones might have suffered as a result of Stalin or other Soviet leaders. Can I ask you this? Who recognized that it was causing distress? Was it because of public protest or was it because of something that uh, the government understood could be upsetting? I'm wondering how they achieved that. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a bit unclear about that. It does seem to have been a consensus. I don't believe that Uh, People had actually, you know, taken their own actions to destroy or remove the statues. But, of course, you had a complete change of regime in 1989 from, you know, a Soviet-dominated socialist one into, well, it's not tremendously democratic today, but at least a nominally democratic government that was anti Soviet and anti-socialist. And obviously, we're probably not going to have that in the United States or in the UK in the near future. So we're not going to say the regime has changed. So, you know, all evidence of the previous regime is going to be rethought. Um, but for example, I mean, I'm, I am not a person of color, but were I a person of color, and even as one, as a white person, um, I don't live in Bristol, but if I did, I think it might be somewhat painful to regularly walk past the statue of Colston, a man who made a fortune directly. You know, he was not simply a beneficiary of clever investments in the cotton trade. He was a trader in human beings. There we have Natalie saying she isn't black. If she lived in Bristol, she might feel uncomfortable about walking past Colston's statue. What do you think when you hear those kind of sentiments not coming directly from the black community and not coming from somebody who has um, endured, perhaps, the um, the times of walking past it? Well, I can only speak for myself, and I wouldn't dream of trying to speak for other people. Um, I can empathise with what Natalie's saying. Obviously, some people probably do have a visceral reaction to uh, statues, but that personally doesn't affect me. I mean, I've been leading tour guides in Liverpool for almost a quarter of a century, and I actually use the statues of merchants in Liverpool, some of whom were people who owned slave plantations. Um, I actually use them as a teaching tool. For me, the public realm is probably the best classroom. It's somewhere where I can engage with groups that I could never reach in a lecture theatre or or in just a, a you know a school classroom. So I use these statues as a very um, useful visual tool for explaining the history of Liverpool and how that history has developed uh, the public realm. It's very difficult, though, isn't it, to, to assume that everybody can get a tour guide rather than just walk past and see something that perhaps in their eyes glorifies a horrible incident in the past rather than having it explained to them. 
Well, for me, that means that we should employ more tour guides to do this nationally. There should be a national scheme to interpret the public realm and the political figures that are memorialised within it. That isn't, for me, a good reason to uh, wipe away the statues. I would like to see them re retained and reinterpreted, and in doing so, provide employment and education rather than simply erasure. I want you to tell us a little bit later about your campaign, which has been going on for some years now, to get a statue erected to commemorate the slave trade uh, through Liverpool. Uh, but we're going to put up some pictures now of some damage being done to other different types of monuments of Christopher Columbus in Boston. And then you'll see um, King Leopold II in Belgium and then Winston Churchill graffiti on his in, in London. And Clive, I'm going to come to you and ask, how do you decide what is explained about these statues if that is what is deemed to be necessary? My answer to that would be... Uh, First of all, put it in perspective. Most people walk past statues and haven't got a clue who they are or what they are, and that applies to me as much as many other people. I do think the point that has just been made is quite important. Locally, this can matter a lot. So if the local community wants to change things in terms of a particular statue, then that should be listened to and assisted. And if a local community in Bristol, if we take the Colston case, had said, we want that statue out because it's a constant reminder for us of a painful time, then the case for it going would be strong. But I would then say, don't hide your history. I really do emphasize that. You put it in a museum or you put some description of what happened and and what the background was so that people mm. understand it. I could give a number of examples uh, where it, it goes wrong if you're not careful. I met my own old constituency when I was an elected MP in Hammersmith, there was an attempt to change the names in one of my biggest council estates called White City. The vast bulk of the population there from, were ethnic minorities, black, Asian, and also Iris, and, and it was a relatively small percent white British origin, about, I think it was something like 15 percent. There was an attempt to change all the names of the roads, which were very much linked around empire and, and indeed around some people who had dodgy re reputations from the slave trade. The local population voted strongly against changing any of them. It was a one, uh, there was a pub called the General Smuts Pub. There was another. And, it, you know, you can't just ignore that. I mean, why they voted the way they did, I really don't know. But I, you have to accept and listen to it. What do you make of this, Natalie, and indeed the rest of you as well, but I'll go to Natalie first. Susan Neiman, author, moral philosopher, uh, she put down in print, Germans use their history to think about an uncertain future, while Britons use their history to console themselves for a less glorious present. I think that's quite accurate. Um, in terms of the case of the Colston statue in Bristol, um, I do know that for the past 15 to 20 years, Local activists, uh, both BAME and others, have been agitating, not even to have the statue removed, but simply to have a plaque added contextualizing it in terms of the history of the slave trade. But they were not able to accomplish this, and this was not because the people of Bristol voted as Clive's former constituents did to say, we're, we're happy with things as they are. It was that a small, overwhelmingly white, very wealthy elite refused to even consider putting up the plaque. So while in general, I'm not necessarily in favor of doing what happened in Bristol, you know, I, I do think that Lawrence made an important point about using these artworks as teaching tools. But in this case, I think this was two decades of frustration that boiled over. Um, so in that case, I am quite sympathetic to it. I'm also somewhat skeptical of the idea that if a statue comes down, whether through direct action or um, the decisions of local citizens or councils, that history is somehow erased. There's no statue that I know of anywhere in the world in public of Adolf Hitler, but we haven't forgotten who he is. There are no statues anywhere of the Prophet Muhammad because Islamic tradition forbids that kind of representation, and yet Muhammad is still pretty well known. So I don't think that when a statue is removed or recontextualized or placed elsewhere that somehow we have erased anything. Okay, therefore you have to perhaps question the... the 
the benefit of taking it down if memories do still remain. Lawrence, let me ask you this one. Um, Oriel College, Oxford, uh, have decided at last to take down the statue of Cecil Rhodes because of his times in Africa, his reputation as a racist and a colonizer. What do you think has changed? Because a few years ago they said, no, we won't. What do you think has changed in the last few years what, what is the climate now compared to i don't to even think it's in the last five few years, years. I, think it's, I think it's an immediate reaction to what is the, the events that have uh, taken place most recently um that's led in many ways to a lot of organizations institutions reevaluating their positions on this particular issue i mean whether or not that means road scholarships will go or if they'll be they'll change the focus and maybe associate them totally with the countries that uh, Rhodes was so responsible for exploiting rather than, you know, rich people, the likes of um, the Clintons, etc. Um, that would probably be a more constructive step from my perspective than simply removing his statue. Again, for me, and, and re-evaluating that, genuinely, you think, or is it just knee-jerk? I think it's, I think it's knee-jerk. I don't know how sincere the people who are in these positions are for them to simply change overnight when people have been pleading with them for years to do something about this would suggest to me that it, it, it's somewhat disingenuous to say the least. Is it Craven, Clive, do you think? Well, uh, I don't know. I think, uh, can I just pick up the point? Uh, the I, I really don't think you can compare these statues to Hitler, Mohammed and so on. Those are such big names that it makes a very real difference. The sort of statues we're talking about, in most cases, aren't well known. Rhodes is perhaps an exception to that, but by and large, it's not. And I still would come back to the fact it's far better to do an explanation rather than a removal or something of that nature, unless you put it in a museum, maybe, whatever. I do think the education bit is very important in all of this, because the other thing that troubles me at times is that we don't actually remember all our history on this. We're, we're remembering quite rightly at the moment the problem of the slave trade and what happened to, uh, uh, <coughs> to George Floyd in the United States. But there's a bigger history too, and it was about a massive campaign by people uh, starting in the 18th century actually and going through to the mid-19th, late 19th century, to abolish the transatlantic slave trade, which was the worst part of the slave trade, and also to stop it being practiced in South and North America, so that British ships at the time were entering the ports in South America and burning the slave ships. And that was actually declared illegal at the moment. Now, people at the time, people don't actually understand the full expanse of this. It is a combination of slavery, of uh, the, the empire, the colonialism, and so on. But at times, we muddle those three up, and there are three or four very different things in there. And racism is the underlying problem that joins the dots together. And that's what we ought to be addressing, particularly the institutional racism, because we've got quite good laws in the UK now against uh, racial abuse but we are not doing enough or anywhere near enough about institutional racism. Yeah, I'm going to throw this one to, to, to Lawrence. Uh, are these protesters perhaps missing the point? I'm going to read something from Trevor Phillips, former chair of the Commission for Racial Equality, controversial figure as it happens, and he put this down. If the Black Lives Matter activists were truly pursuing radical change rather than street theatre, they would tear themselves away from persecuting ghosts and statues and take their anger to the doors of the great British companies which have no person of colour on their boards. What he's saying is that this really doesn't matter. There are bigger battles to be fought. Well, you know, I would have to agree with Trevor on the whole. Uh, I do think that this is a straw man. I do think there's bigger issues that should be addressed. But these things take research. You know, to go and pull down a statue, we all have a high and then we go home. But the conditions that we're living in do doesn't change much more important to go ahead and do that serious academic research in some cases and be able to provide a justified argument why reparations is something that people should uh, be appealing for. You know, we've just seen Lloyds of London accept that they have got a connection to slavery and they will do something about making reparation. Could do that across the board for many institutions that can direct, directly trace their links back to slavery. I feel that Black Lives Matter would probably be better served if they were involved in some of this longer term, more difficult types of activism that will actually change things for people in their everyday lives, rather than simply um, pulling down um, inanimate objects. I'm going to come back to you and ask you about uh, your plans for an inanimate object uh, in Liverpool 
in just a moment. But Natalie, I want to bring up Clive's point that this is also mm -hmm. very nuanced, that um, although there was slavery and people were transported from Africa to Britain, Britain to the United States, other parts of the world, that there was bravery too in, in the way that the British slavery having been abolished, went about trying to enforce that. Sailors lost their lives, etc., etc. You cannot simply say that this is what happened and this is wrong. So how could putting a plaque on something, explaining it, explain it? Well, I think, for example, if, for example, the Colston Society in Bristol had been willing to add a plaque saying Colston was indeed, you know, a, a very inspiring philanthropist, to the city of Bristol, you know, he he made a huge fortune and he gave most of it away, um, for example, to educational charities and to the development of the city's infrastructure, and that's indeed praiseworthy. He could have just sat around being a rich man, indulging himself. On the other hand, I think it is important to say where did that money come from? Um, that you know, the reason that he had so much money to give away was that he traded in human beings. He bought and sold men, women, and children. He took them from their lives in Africa. He sold them, the survivors, who were probably only about 80... Natalie, with all due respect, how are you going to fit all that on a plinth at the bottom of the statue? You could probably at least uh, put it down to two or three sentences, and you could also probably have you know, a suggestion of, of where you could find further information. And that would be good enough? I think it would be a start. You know, no black or minority British person's life was made better in terms of their educational or professional opportunities. Um, no potentially racist and violent police officer decided not to be abusive to minorities in the UK when the Colston statue went into the harbor. So in that sense, you know, I, I somewhat agree with Trevor Phillips, but I don't think it's an either or. I don't think either you engage in sometimes theatrical protests and put graffiti on or tear down statues, or you are seriously committed to solving institutional racism. I think yeah. many people are both. Okay. Well, we're talking about pulling down statues. Now we're going to talk about putting them up. And Clive, I want to get your thoughts on how hard it was to get Mary Seacole's statue outside St. Thomas's Hospital in London. Some advice for Lawrence and then your campaign, Lawrence, to get a statue built um, in, not in honour of slavery, but uh, commemorating slavery in that city. Clive, you first. Mary Seacole, how hard? It was hard, and frankly, people are not interested so much in giving money for statues these days. They'd rather give uh, money to some good cause, uh, you know, the cure of cancer or something of that nature. So raising money is hard, and it took me 12 years to get all the money I needed for that. Uh, I think it was particularly difficult because she was a historical figure, way you know, way back beyond many people's experience or knowledge, and she'd only just been introduced to the British educational curriculum. So young people often knew about her. The older generations didn't. And yet she was profoundly important at times and very popular. Um, and and advice say, for well, Lawrence, if you wouldn't mind. Find some people or organisations with large sums of money who want to do something for the arts. That is your absolute key. And get on your committee people who've got those contacts. I had some wonderful people on my committee. They were nurses and they were really driven and they <laughs> raised Clive, money. I, th I think we're going to have to get you on the phone to Lawrence. Enough. The, programme's, the programme's almost wrapped up. And Lawrence, I wanted to ask you, what obstacles have you found in your way as, apart from, from money? Uh, people don't want to see this sort of thing, perhaps? There's always that objection here in Liverpool. There's also an issue around history. Some people are unaware of this history. Some people will tell you slaves never set foot in Liverpool, although Liverpool was the, the main slave trading port. But what we've done is we've created a justification through, for that through um, the historical groups that I uh, run, which do use academics for their activism. So we use primary evidence to prove the point that we're trying to make. And so far... We've received some really positive uh, support from uh, the general public. We raised a fundraiser. When I saw the Colston statue came down, almost out, out, out of desperation, I started up a, a, a fundraiser on Facebook, and it's currently raised £35,000. So there's been a lot of really positive goodwill towards what we're trying to do here in Liverpool to acknowledge those who uh, lived in Liverpool and were enslaved 
who died here and were buried here, but lay without a marker. So not how, only how long has it taken you so far, and, and how much do you? Need? Well, well, again, I could give you a much longer context, but the, since I've gone public, that money has been raised within two weeks. So you know, if we continue to to, to uh, go along that path, we should have enough to do what um, uh, what we're intending to do within a very short period of time. And have you thought of the words you're going to put at the bottom? Well, it's not a memorial to the wider issue of the slave trade. It's simply to the Liverpool enslaved, the, Liverpool, the enslaved people who lived, died, and were buried here in this city, who were totally forgotten, who laid in, in, in unmarked graves for over 250 years. And we, we think about now it's about time in a city that is so replete with statues and memorials to the great and the good who made their money through enslaving these people, that they too should have a memorial here in the city in which they died. Look, I appreciate your thoughts, each and every one of you. Uh, that's Lawrence Westgap talking to us there from Liverpool. Uh, Natalie Zacek's in Manchester and Clive Soley in the north of Scotland. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the programme. And thank you for watching this episode of Roundtable. From me, David Foster, and the team that made this possible, we hope to have your company next time. Until then, goodbye.